Hello, it's Phil Croshaw again from Passions. And in this episode, I'm a little bit excited because this is the first time we've had a Knight of the Realm on the show. Sir Andrew Palmley, welcome. Well, hello and a very warm welcome to this new edition of Passions. And today we have a first, actually. Uh, we have a gentleman today on our interview who is actually Sir Andrew Palmley. Uh, he's being very humble in not putting the sir on his on his title there. But I can tell you now he is actually Sir Andrew Palmley. So it's a great first. and I'm very overjoyed to have a first on Passions uh, a, a knight of the realm. So a very warm welcome to Passions, Sir Andrew, and uh, tell us who you are and what you do and what your passion is. Well, uh, Phil, great to see you and thanks for the lovely introduction. And let me tell you why I don't use the Sir very much. It's because my family have always called me Andy and they've taken to calling me Sir Andy. Uh, and you can see the implication of that. So I, I'm much happier being Andrew, but I'm in your hands, of course. <laughs> so I, I've got several passions, Phil. Uh, and it's, uh, by the way, a delight to be speaking to a chap who speaks uh, God's English. Well done, you. Um, so, uh, my, 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 <laughs> I think some people say, some people say I sound more like Liam Gallagher, to be fair, Andrew, but, uh, but there you go. Fair enough. Just get the paycheck. We'll be fine. So uh, I, my, 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 my several, I've got several passions, but I don't want to overload you. So uh, my career has been based on classical music and particularly the world of the pipe organ. Um, but somehow through that uh, interest, I've been drawn into local government politics in the square mile, the famous city of London, and indeed rose to become its Lord Mayor. Uh, but I'm actually consider myself to be a native of, of Blackpool in Lancashire, although I'm actually born in Manchester. Uh, and I've been doing a lot of work with the Blackpool people to um, re resurrect the town and bring it back to its former glory. So th those are my th three agenda items for today, Phil. Fantastic. OK, well, let's start with something that's um, reasonably co close to my heart, uh, as well as geographically being based, as you as you intimated, being based in Manchester and being Man Mancunian. Uh, and that's, of course, Blackpool. Um, it, it's, a, it's a topic in a town that's come up quite a lot in our in our shows for various different reasons. Um, and I'm always a little bit biased because I think I've said on other shows that, that we've done and other interviews we've done, uh, I just love going over to Blackpool. And before we came on air, we were talking about Bispam, where I know you're close to. So talk to me about um, your passion for Blackpool, how it came about. So as a, as a little boy, my parents decided that they would relocate to, to Blackpool, which is what we did when I was, I think, maybe six years old. Uh, and I went to a little state primary school behind Blackpool Pleasure Beach, Europe's greatest amusement park, uh, and was trying to do my, my childish mathematics to the sound of people screaming on the Big Dipper as they shot past the classroom window. Uh, and I, it just seemed to me as I grew up that this was a perfectly normal place to, to be with uh, a mixture of sand and the tower and the piers and people enjoying themselves and others working. Um, I stayed here till I was 18, I went to college, uh, then came back and my first employment was as musical director of the Blackpool Pleasure Beach, which had a variety of, of uh, theatres in those days. Uh, and I took over the musical directorship of Showtime on Ice. So one of my earliest claims uh, is that I accompanied Mary Chipperfield's ice skating chimpanzees in the ice drum at Blackpool. Uh, after a little while in, in Blackpool, I went back to London and we can talk about that uh, later on. Uh, 40 years later, uh, I was living in the mansion house and a chap from Blackpool came to see me to say, we, we, we want to re-kickstart the town. Would you help us? And I've thrown myself into that in all sorts of ambassadorial ways. Uh, we've got a pride of place scheme. Uh, we, we've got a, a, an alumni scheme, all sorts of things going on. And basically, we've been really hectoring uh, government to come and look after us and try and sort a few of our problems out. So let me tell you some of the good things that are going on in the town at the minute. Uh, we've got, got a, a brand new tramway system and that is being extended up to the railway station, making life a lot easier. Uh, we now have direct trains to London several times a day. 
we've got uh, one new five-star hotels and several four-star hotels, a brand new conference center, and we're expecting the, the political parties to be returning to us quite soon as they did in the heyday. Um, we've had a 300 million pound investment into uh, tourism and leisure. We've got the world's fastest internet cable, and this one really surprises me. The fastest link to United States um, comes from New York through, uh, through Dublin and the Isle of Man and lands at South Shore in Blackpool. Uh, so we've capitalised on that thing. You know, if you wish, wish to have a back office, you people in London, why not consider placing it in Blackpool? There are worse places to be. Uh, we have uh, brilliant uh, weather. We've got a, a microclimate. The sun is always shining. The sky is always blue. Uh, and uh, it's a good place in which to live and work and study in addition to, to visit in the traditional way. And we, we, we're not shy or embarrassed about the the kiss me quick rock, the stick of rock etc uh, image that we've got it's just good clean old-fashioned fun uh, at the same time the town's got its problems we've got a we've got a, a social housing problem in that all those little bed and breakfasts that people used to use in years gone by uh, people don't wish to use them in, in that same way and they've been bought up sometimes by unscrupulous landlords who are using them as houses of multiple occupation for the vulnerable and taking uh, their, their income directly from the state uh, hand over fist. This comes with people with a range of, of, uh, of, of problems, uh, uh, educational uh, abuse problems, um, uh, and um, a, a range of difficult social issues arise from it, putting strains on the schools and putting strains uh, on the hospitals here. Uh, but we are addressing this as well. And incidentally, we're not, we're not turning our back on these people. They need our help. So we are developing all sorts of structures to make those people welcome in the town and, and better and financially uh, contributory uh, citizens. How important then has been not just your passion, but also the passion of your peer groups and the people involved in this project? How important has the passion been in terms of driving it forward and making it happen? It's quite remarkable that uh, only five years ago, there was a great deal of reticence. You know, the town's had its day, things have moved on, people have gone to Spain and forgotten us, etc. You've heard all those arguments. Uh, in fact, people haven't gone to Spain. And even today, 18 million people come, well, not in lockdown, but when they can, 18 million people come per annum. And our, our, our economy is largely driven by um, fun in the summer and the illuminations in the autumn. But I, I'm a great believer in saying to people, we're going to do this. And then um, even when I don't know how we're going to do it, we're going to do it. Let's have a can do attitude. So you gather people around you and you, uh, persuade the naysayers and the doom mongers that it is, it is possible. Uh, and gradually you get a groundswell of support. So we've had a range of business people up here. I've, I've uh, had three delegations of business types, including a delegation of information technologists coming to look at our internet connection to talk about uh, investment in the town. We've now got two enterprise zones. The old Blackpool Airport is being converted into an enterprise zone, as is the old ICI site uh, further up in, in Thornton. And we're looking at how we can create uh, lots of job opportunities. So our, our primary schools are our, our, our class beaters. Early, early days in secondary schools, not so good. But we're working at the top end and we're now making sure that every child in Blackpool schools has a lot of work experience opportunity, good quality experience opportunity. Uh, and as a former member of, of um, Cameron's apprenticeship delivery board, uh, you know, I happen to go to university. It's not right for everybody and there's nothing wrong or shameful about taking an apprenticeship. Uh, in fact, it makes a lot of sense. You know, Not only do you get a skill which gives you a job, but you get paid for learning. Well, what, what could be better than that? So, uh, no, the, the, the passion has been shared and people are really, really coming on board and saying, come on, let's make Blackpool what it was again. And I tell you who I'm really trying to crack, and I hope they're not listening, but if they are, I, I, I don't regret saying it. It's the taxi <laughs> drivers. Now, if you go to New York or Melbourne today and get in a cab, the driver will say, how long are you here for? These are the three things you've got to do while you're here. These, these are great. Right? Last time I got into a cab in Blackpool, when I came up to do an interview, uh, and I had to be wearing a tangerine tie, which is the color of the football club. And the driver said, what are you doing coming to a dump like this? And what are you doing wearing the tie of that disgusting football club? Now, I don't know if you follow football, Phil, but we're doing quite well at the minute. And I just thought that's the first impression, isn't it? Well, can we please just have a cheerful welcome and explain what is good about our town? So it's it's perception as much as anything, but we're getting there. 
Absolutely. I do follow football. Well, allegedly I follow football because I'm a Bolton Wanderers fan. So, <laughs> so, uh, but then we're doing pretty well at the moment. We're, one more win and we're promoted as we do yeah. this interview in uh, in April 2021. <laughs> so we're doing okay. Good for you. Uh, good yeah. well, but, good no, it's, it's, a, it's a great point you make, actually. A very good point you make. And um, certainly in my career, my corporate career, before I started doing my own thing and running my own businesses and such like, um, there was it, it, we were always trying to get the staff and the employees to talk about the up, you know, um, up talk the, the company about how good we are, what we can do for people, why you should book with it. Thomas Cook was one of my one of my companies, and um, it just seems to be it's, it's such an instant obvious means of promotion word of mouth through your employees why do you think that's happening is it because they're not being led and i don't want to put obviously put you on the spot but is it because they're not being led is it because they're not being trained is it because what do you think is the reason why they would say that well they, they, these are people are, are at the, at the chalk faces teachers used to say you know that they're, they're seeing mm. the downside of the town day in day out mm. and they don't see what mm. we as casual visitors see as we pop in for for a weekend or, or a week or two um but it is it is about leadership it is about uh, demonstrating what's good about the town and it's about repeating the message you know years ago i was a teacher and at the start of a lesson you'd say to the kids what what it is you're going to learn today then you teach the lesson and at the end you'd say and now this is what you have learned we just keep hammering the same point over and over again so one of the things I was about to do before the lockdown came was to get uh, leaders of every um, work, work uh, opportunity in Blackpool into the Tower Circus, the famous Tower Circus, um, to give them a pep talk on, on what I'm expecting you to say to people when you meet them for the first time. You know, so I'm talking to, to school leaders, to uh, shopkeepers, to taxi drivers, to the hoteliers, to absolutely anybody who's got a, an interface with the tourist in industry particularly. Uh, but on top of that, as we bring more and more business types into town, uh, and as we bring the conference into town, you know, you don't want a jaundiced taxi driver putting off a journalist first stop. I mean, I'll digress briefly to say Blackpool gets uh, terrible write-ups in the national press, and including the, the big papers, uh, because journalists are looking for a bad story. And they get off the train, and the train happens not to be in the best part of town, the station there. They find something that, that they find unpleasant, and they go back to London instantly and write about it. They don't come to me and ask for a good, because you know, upbeat stories don't sell, I guess. Uh, but gradually, we're, we're chipping away at that. But it needs uh, leadership, and it needs people to be told, um, you don't know how lucky you are living in Blackpool. This is a great place. Look at the benefits. So, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get there, Phil. We'll get there. I think you've just totally hit the nail on the head there actually um back to what i was saying there about when i was in thomas cook and we wanted people to talk about thomas cook in a favorable way you're absolutely right when you say that quite often if you're in a company particularly if you're working in say customer services or something like that you tend to see up close and personal when there's a problem and just like you said there, the taxi driver maybe sees the fight that happens behind some pub somewhere. But actually, when I turn up with my wife for that walk up uh, up the prom, which we were talking to you about before we came on air up towards Bispam Way, um, or I bring the kids over to see the illuminations, they just see what they see. We just see what we see, which is... Um, particularly when I said to you before, like the, you know, especially when it's stormy in Blackpool, I love it when that sea is going a bit crazy. And that's what you see. You have some fish and chips, you have a nice walk, you, see, you look out at the sea, you get some fresh air, the kids get some sparkly things and see all the flashing lights. You know, that's the that's what we see and that's what we what we experience. It's 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 first impressions. I know mean, over mm, the uh, it is. various offices. The key person is, isn't the, the chief exec, the chairman or the managing director. The, the key person to me is the person who answers the phone, you know, the point of first contact, creating that right atmosphere. Good morning. And how can I help you today? Et cetera, et cetera. I'll give you an, a, a, the opposite example. And this is an example, uh, not, not particularly against northerners, but it, you know, we're more guilty of it than many. Uh, on, a, on a Sunday recently, I was walking past the church. And the church door was open. I, as a church organist, I had no intention of going in, obviously. Um, but I, I went past the uh, the door, and there's an 18 year old lad arrived on his bike, and he, he made to go into the church. 
Uh, and I stayed to watch what happened. Two ladies of, of some age said to him, have you booked in? No, you're not coming in then. And it turned out the lad's mother had just died. And an old man came along and said, come here, lad, and sat down with him on the bench. Now that to me says, you know, point of first contact, can we just at least be polite and share the good news? Uh, you never know what the backstory is. Yeah, I, I think that's, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, and obviously a wonderful story. Um, but I, I can see it's going play. Just, just to, just before we move on from the black pill thing, um, there was a lot of talk a few years ago about some big bid to become what they call that was like the Las Vegas of, oh, of yes. the of the North. Right. What, what do you know what happened there? Because it, it it was quite exciting, but it just didn't <laughs> seem to get over the line. Well, it's an interesting thing. Um, the, the, I think the nation decided, or the parliament, the government at the time decided there was room in the country for one super casino. And we are the obvious town to have that super casino. Mm. Mm. Lots of other towns put in a bid, including Manchester. Mm. Mm. Um, and the, the preparations were made. Indeed, one chap paid many millions of pounds for the airport uh, and rebranded it Blackpool International because he expected the private jets to be arriving uh, with the people coming to use the casino. Uh, at the wow. very last second, the government gave the contract to Manchester, not to Blackpool, even though we, we'd written the we'd even written the press releases, it was so in the bag. Um, it went to Manchester. Manchester in the end never built it. Um, and I, don't I was going to say, I don't know of any super casinos. No, no, no. And to be honest, I, I, I'm not a gambler. And I didn't know what one of these things was uh, until I was uh, abroad with a friend who took me to a casino. And actually, a very pleasant experience. It's not slot machines in a row in that Las Vegas style. Yeah. It's a fun place for the kids, nice restaurants, yeah. 10 pin bowling, all sorts of activities. And if you want to gamble, go through the door and it's there for you. So anyway. I think we, I we do actually... Sorry. No, no, absolutely. I, I, I totally agree. I totally understand. Um, and we, we have an example here in uh, just outside Manchester, of course, in Salford, in the way that Media City's transformed. Have you been over to Media City, yes. where BBC, ITV, Coronation Street and so on and so forth. But that was a, a dilapidated area, was frankly, no go area after six, six o'clock in the evening. I might be slightly exaggerating, but only slightly. Um, and now, of course, it's an absolute hive of activity. There's a there's a, there's a fun media vibe, you know. Um, whenever you walk through, especially being into video and podcasting and all the stuff I'm into, the media, digital media stuff, I, I just get a great vibe there. So that's a good example where anybody of a certain age wouldn't remember or know that it was had those challenges. They just see what they see now. It'll be a beautiful transformational uh, thing. And it's it's amazing what infrastructure can do to transform the, the landscape uh, and mm. people's attitudes. You know, I'm very hopeful that we can get a, a, a light railway going throughout the filed coast for your viewers. I'm not sure what that means. That's the, the bit of land that sticks out from Lytham at the bottom up to Fleetwood at the top. Um, and, um, the, you know, there was a there was a British rail line. I think we could resurrect it and get the trams going. As soon as you've got transport, you, you, you've got prosperity. Fantastic. Right. OK, so we've got Blackpool and we've got your background and we've got all your experiences in Blackpool. And uh, a few years later, we catapult forward <laughs> and we head down south. And to be brutally honest, you end up as Lord Mayor of London. Tell yeah. me how that happened, Andrew. I have not the slightest idea. I mean, <laughs> I... Uh... I've, I've, I, I don't know what your viewers know about the Lord Mayor of London. The Lord Mayor of London, it's an office which goes back well over 800 years. Um, it's unpaid. In fact, it costs quite a bit to do it. Uh, and the chief job these days is to tour the world representing financial services, uh, the activities that go on in the square mile. And to many people, that's, uh, that's a remote uh, and, uh, 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 and impossible thing to, to contemplate. You know, what's financial services got to do with me? Well, wherever you are in the country, the possibility is that if you've got a pension, it's being invested through the financial square mile. Uh, so the Lord Mayor travels the world, creating opportunities for, for British people to invest overseas and for overseas investors to invest through the UK. UK. Uh, and I could bore you to death with statistics for, forever, Phil, about how much money goes through London every day and all that stuff. I mean, the basic bottom line is is that um, the Corporation of London, which is the, the oldest continuous local authority in the world, uh, the governing body of which the Lord Mayor is, is head, uh, the the, common, the Co Corporation of London uh, put, puts into the Treasury at least £75 billion a year. So we are, in effect, paying for 
you know, large parts of the defence, the education or the national health budget, whichever way you care to look at it. And in fact, it's not exclusively about the square mile. Many people think that uh, the square mile is the only place where financial services are housed, but in fact, it's a nationwide industry. In the square mile, we've got 500,000 workers, or only 8,000 people live there, but the rest uh, commute in by tube every day and whatever. Um, but actually, the industry employs a total of 2.2 million people spread right across the United Kingdom. So this is a, 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 an industry of great importance nationally. Uh, now, how does a working class uh, schoolboy with pretensions to study music in Blackpool come to be the law bearer of the city of London? Well, I've, I've never in my life applied for a job, but pl pleasant things seem to happen to me now and then. So, um, and I can't, I can't extricate the music bit uh, at this stage from the Merrill bit. So my mother had a little boarding house, one of the ones we were talking about down South Shore near, near the Pleasure Beach near, near where I was at school. And the meat in those far off days was delivered by a boy with a basket on the front of a bicycle. And I would be, my mother had a piano and I, I didn't know how to play it, but I used to fiddle with it when I was little. And this meat boy used to say to my mother, he should learn to do that properly. And I would say whatever the equivalent of get lo get lost was when you're a kid. And um, anyway, <laughs> when I went to when I went to the big school and I went to uh, Blackpool Grammar School, this boy was the head boy, and he said, "Now then, Palmy, you're going to learn to play the keyboard properly, and let me show you how the, the school organ works." I'd never heard of a school organ. Well, I was immediately uh, entranced because you can make a big, big noise on your own with an organ, much more than you can. I mean. The, the equivalent is, is a rock band with all its amplifiers. I mean, we, we, you, but you, you know, we do it on our own. So I started studying the organ really seriously uh, with a great teacher and um, uh, I'd had planned to go to a northern university. I thought I was far too shy to survive in London. Uh, but when I was in the upper six in the January, I saw in the musical paper um, uh, scholarships offered at the Royal Academy of Music, but provided by the Royal College of Organists. Come to London on such a day and play such a piece, and you can have the scholarship and go to a conservatoire. Uh, so I got on the bus, as we did in those days, couldn't afford the train, and um, went to London, and I played my bit of bark, and I got a scholarship to the Royal Academy of Music. Unbelievable. Uh, and just to finish that little episode, on day one of arriving at the Academy, I must be 18, it was a Saturday, uh, and I didn't know what to do with myself, and I just waved goodbye to my parents. Uh, and I realised it was the, the day of the last night of the proms. So I went up to the Albert Hall to see what was going on. And there was just a crowd of people milling around outside, so I, I stood amongst them. Suddenly somebody appeared and marshalled us into pairs. And the man next to me said, have you got a ticket? And I said, no. He said, well, I've been coming all season with my friend, but he can't come tonight. Uh, so you can have his season ticket for 50 pence. Uh, so, and he said, when the doors open, follow me. So... I'm standing outside the other hall with my 50 pence to hit the doors open or you run like hell. And suddenly I was standing immediately behind the conductor's podium. And when I got home that night to my digs, I phoned my parents and they said, we've just seen you on the last night of the proms. How ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> the day I left London. Anyway, so as you know, I... Um, I, I did I did my stint at the academy uh, and came back to Blackpool, went to the Pleasure Beach, as we've discussed. Um, and then I got married and thought that I would move into theatre. Uh, and I did a bit of theatre um, before going to education, which was really where I should have been. Uh, but in 1982, the organist of a little city church, you know how there are many little wren churches in the city, one of these little wren churches with the bizarre name of St. James Garlic Highs. Um, and I can explain that if it's of interest. Um, the organist said to me, would I play for a service? He couldn't go. So February 1982, I showed up uh, and he never came back. So I've stood in for well over 39 years at this <laughs> as the organist uh, and never yet been paid. I mean, uh, after the first service, the vicar, and I've now got my fifth vicar, the vicar said, what do we owe you? And I said, don't worry, I'll see Simon. And I've never seen him since. But I just did. Just to round that out, uh, I, I, that chap became organist of Salisbury Cathedral. So if anybody's watching who knows the church circuit will know who I'm talking about. Um, I, I got hold of his email address and I invented a, an invoice and sent him a bill for £207,000. And do you know, I've never had a response. Can't believe it. <laughs> That's a disgrace, isn't it? <laughs> Anyway, I'm, and I'm, I'm coming back to your proper point now, Phil. So, yeah, no, I, yes, yeah. that's great. I love that. I love these stories. They're great. But I, I know you can edit the whole lot out, so don't worry no, about it. No, we're a big fan of stories on this show. Brilliant. Fill your well, boots, Andrew. 
So I, I then found myself with a, a, a church warden of St. James. We'd been for dinner in Cambridge and I was driving him back. Uh, and he said, would you like to join the Common Council? Uh, to which I said, what's the Common Council? He said, it's the local authority for the City of London. It's the largest authority in the country. And in those days, it was 150 members. It's now 125. Divided into 25 aldermen and 100 councillors. There's no politics. Everybody's independent. And there's no... Um, there's no um, money. You don't get attendance money as you would in other councils, but you do get the odd treat uh, and you get invited to special events. Uh, so I said, well, if nobody else wants to do it, uh, I'll stand. I didn't really get what it was, but I stood. Um, and I got in by a huge majority, which is to say um, I got 17 votes and my one opponent got three. Uh, so I found myself uh, a common councilman and uh, joined in and the, the first letter i got was from buckingham palace and it said uh, her majesty the queen commands you to attend luncheon in guildhall to celebrate uh, the, tw the 40th anniversary of her accession and i said to my wife this has clearly gone to the wrong address we don't get invited to have our lunch with the queen anyway that's what my chum was meaning by we get invited to special events so lord mayor's banquets state functions etc uh, uh, and so, okay, great. So I started doing my bid as a councillor and I chaired a few committees and after 10 years, the alderman for my ward, I don't, don't know if that needs expla explaining, alderman's an old fashioned expression for a, a sort of upper house. And indeed the House of Commons House of Lords is based on the Common Council Court of Aldermen. Uh, my my uh, predecessor as alderman for the ward suggested that I stand for election. I, I had no intention of doing so, but he kept pressing the point. So to keep him happy, I stood. And again, I had one opponent and that one opponent was destined to win the seat because he'd filled the ward with votes for himself. Um, the day before the election, he was found dead on the back seat of his car. And I always say that so whilst the knife had my initials on it, they never pinned it on me. Um, the, poor, <laughs> the poor man, uh, it's, it's sad, the poor man had, uh, had, had a, 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 a massive aneurysm and uh, only 49, he had two small children. So I phoned mm -hmm. the town clerk and said, look, the, the, the opposition has passed away, sadly. Uh, I, I imagine that means we start again. And he said, no, um, there's now one candidate, one vacancy. So tomorrow you become um, the alderman for Vintry Ward. OK, I became the alderman for Vintry Ward. Um, in the meantime, joined several of the ancient city livery companies, and that's a, a topic perhaps for another day, uh, but did my bit as an alderman, eventually uh, selected initially by one's peers, the other 24, but then endorsed by the livery, 25,000. Um, I became one of two sheriffs in uh, 2014 and lived in the Old Bailey for a year, uh, where it was my job to accompany the Lord Mayor of the day uh, and shadow him. All these jobs are, are for one year only. Um, and during that year, I decided to put my hat in the ring to become Lord Mayor and I interviewed for the job and I was appointed for 2016-17. So on the morning of, um, I think it was the 9th of November uh, 2016, uh, I was um, in studios from six o'clock in the morning giving live interviews. That's where you learn how to deal with the media when you're half asleep. Uh, and that afternoon at three, I became Lord Mayor in the silent ceremony. Uh, and uh, the next day I had the Lord Mayor's show, which had a massive musical uh, bias, as you might imagine. And on the Monday night, uh, I hosted the Lord Mayor's banquet with 780 guests and Theresa May uh, as my principal guest doing her first Lord Mayor's banquet and State of the Nation speech, followed by the most exhausting year anybody could imagine. Uh, I was away for 100 days visiting <coughs> countries 250 uh, live telly and radio interviews endless inwards visits from from i don't know monarchs presidents governors of central banks etc uh, and charity work and church work and a lot of military work as well uh, so in the course of the 12 months I, I i managed to get three days off including the weekends and on an average day you would see 10 different people um, but the worst days you would have 20 half hour uh, uh, meetings and really very hard work that's just such a fascinating story. I've, I've asked my few of my guests this, actually. Was there any moment you can think back to where you thought, wow, how has this happened? This young, this young boy, this young lad from Blackpool, and I've, I'm here, I'm doing this, I've got the. Is there any time you can remember thinking that? I'm not saying you, you jumped up in the air and punched the air, but did it ever enter your mind? When you're in Mansion House, you don't jump anywhere. You're so exhausted. You don't do anything. You just do as you told. But actually, I, I have that feeling absolutely every day of my life. Though. I'm amazed that I'm, I'm speaking to you. That, that I, I've just had a life uh, which I've 
I, I don't find particularly interesting. I mean, I, I mean, I certainly won't be writing my memoirs. Uh, so I find it fascinating that that you would want to speak to me about it. But you know, I'm grateful. Thank you. I, I think that you're, you're very welcome. I think it's um, what I what I see outside looking in, if you like, is that story is just filled with so many insights and arguably some inspiration too you know and, and I, it's, it's a strange thing and i've said this quite a few t times on these shows how the word luck comes up a lot you know i was lucky and these are people like yourself that are you know very accomplished high achievers and many different arenas from theater to motor racing you yeah. name it but they talk about they talk about luck a lot and i always challenge it because what I see is a range of choices and decisions that are taken in most cases. So, uh, for example, without going on about it, but, but for example, if I look around me here in Manchester and some of the friends that I've, I've got that I've had since, arguably since childhood, um, they've never moved from within three miles of where they've ever lived. Hmm. Now, my career took off because I moved down, I moved down in my early 20s, I moved down to Peterborough to where Thomas Cook's head office and my career just went, exploded. But it was a hard time because I had to move away. I was away from my family. It's the first mm. time I've been away because I didn't go to university, uh, much to my mum's horror. <clears throat> um, so when you when you look back in that context, do, do you can you see that maybe some of the key decisions that you took that somebody else might not have taken and therefore might not have had the opportunities that you had? Well, it's, a, it's a very interesting thought and one I've not explored, but I, I will do after we've met today. Uh, my, my grandmother always said you make your own luck. Um, but actually, I, I've got a simple mantra. I'm a great optimist and virtually whatever I'm asked, I say yes. So a couple of days ago, I was on a Zoom call um, with a college I won't name. Would I chair an appeal to raise 50 million quid? And I said, yes, of course. Uh, I've no idea how. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know where it's going to come from. Um, but I st my starting point is, yes, that's how I came to be married to a lovely lady. And we just celebrated 40th anniversary. Um, you know, just, just say yes. And occasionally, occasionally it's the wrong answer. Not often. Uh, and uh, when it is the wrong answer, then you've got to be brave and say, look, I made the wrong call on that occasion. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm now taking that one back. But by and large, yes gets you forward. Um, and you're quite right about leaving home, quite often the catalyst for change in your own life. And I think we, roughly speaking, we divide into two sorts of people, the people who absolutely have to be in one place, that's how they are. And, and people like you and I possibly are, where we can gravitate and be ourselves here or anywhere in the world but actually i know that both you and i have gravitated back to where we may have started in a way so you know no place like home a hundred percent i've traveled and lived all over the world and um yeah i'm back here in manchester so and and strangely when everybody anybody ever asked me wherever i was in the world where's home it was always manchester's home yeah um that was just the, the, yeah that was just the way it was in the north and the northwest of course yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's really really interesting um so um if you hadn't i don't know if you've ever even thought this either but if you hadn't done what you ended up doing what else might you have done do you think your passion for music could have taken you in you know in the in the parallel universe of Apparently, there's supposed to be thousands of different universes, according to string theory. Um, in another universe, do you think you'd have gone taking your passion for music uh, and driven forward with that in a career context? Uh, uh, may maybe so. I mean, I, I still play. I'm, I'm not, I don't play as well as I did do when I was 18. But um, when I was Lord Mayor, I had the privilege of playing the Sanson Organ Symphony with the London Symphony Orchestra in St Paul's Cathedral. So I can play at professional level. Um, but... Um, I think it's down. It's down to your teachers. I, I, I know that's a bit of a cliche, but um, you know, I, my maths teacher wasn't that inspiring. I never understood a word of the science. I sort of understood the English guy, but the music person resonated with me. And in fact, um, I was saying to you before we came on air. Just I've just done seven hours of broadcast last week about the pipe organ, and in the context of those seven hours, three people appeared in totally different contexts all taught by the same teacher in Blackpool. Uh, so he obviously had something about him. 
so it, it just became you know there wasn't really a choice uh, the teacher says we're going to do music so we did music uh, and that's what i did but i i think if i'd had a brilliant uh, physics and chemistry teacher i i may have been an engineer or i may have become a a medic who, who knows and uh, you know um, and bizarrely i've now uh, i've got a i've got two honorary doctorates in addition to a musical one which i earned um w uh, both for um uh, work in financial services and I, I i reckon whilst financial services seems a complex issue it, like many in industries they've just got their own jargon once you learn what the vocabulary is you know it's not rocket science probably so i don't know we, you and i are lucky we were born with with an active brain and inquiring mind and Basically, you can do virtually virtually anything. I just have to go into music. Yeah, I think I think that's the, a good point. I think um, I think being born with what I call, in effect, curiosity is a wonderful thing. Mm. And um, the reason I absolutely love and I have a passion for doing these interviews. And um, before passions, I was interviewing people for many years, and near to six hundred now. And people have said to me, "Why would why do you do it?" and yeah, you know, there's career opportunities from it. There's business opportunities from it. But I'm just curious, or as my wife says, a nosy sod. Um, <laughs> and I'm just curious about people uh, and about their stories and, and how they got to how they got to where they, they went, they got. And so many uh, people and part of the driver behind Passions is to help people to tap into some of these stories and to be inspired or get insight from people who've been on that journey so they can replicate that. And if, even if it's something like, you know what, that one, that interview with uh, that Phil did with uh, Sir Andrew, get that one in again, with Sir Andrew, um, it, it made me think about, you know, I've had opportunities to move away before, but it made me think, you know what, maybe I should, shouldn't be quite so parochial. Maybe I should reach out a little bit. And as a result of that one little thing that they see, they then move away, take a career choice somewhere else, and their whole life changes just as a result of a three or four minute snippet of me and you talking. Uh, I, 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 are you ensuring me against the possibility of this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 well, I hope that is the case. Uh, I, I, I certainly do. I mean, you use the word <clears throat> cure. Um, I, I've got a lot that I still need to do. I'm 64 and I, I bought, I've always got five books on the go at the same time. Uh, because I just want to know, I need to know. Um, and I, I always, whenever I take on a job, and I took one on three years ago, as, as now as the chief executive of the Royal College of Organists, which gave me that break 40 odd years ago, um, uh, whenever an opportunity comes up, I'm still grabbing it. And I, I, I have no intention of retiring. I mean, uh, I used to have an Irish friend who said, um, you're a long time dead. Well, whilst you're not dead, I think you should get up in the morning and do something. But that's inspiring in itself, you know, that whole idea of, of uh, you know, of uh, of getting up and making things happen, hmm. you know, and we talk a lot in our in our business um, about making things happen and driving forward and keeping motivation. Momentum is a word that comes up a lot in a lot of the work we do, keeping the momentum going. Um, hmm. What I'd like to do is just just quickly is just to. Um, explore a little bit your thoughts and insights about the situation in the city of london we're re we're obviously recording this uh, as i said before at the uh, end of april 2021 um, we've pretty much just have had um we've just had uh, brexit not that long ago we've had the pandemic that everybody knows and dare i say loves <laughs> over the last uh, 18 months um What's your views about, from an insider perspective, as to the City of London situation from the financial district, Canary Wharf, all that stuff, uh, the impact of Brexit? What, what do you think might happen in that arena? A very interesting question. And, and uh, it's a slight, I'll, I'll start with the glib answer, which is that London, the City of London survived, survived um, the, the plague, the fire, the, the blitz, uh, and it will survive again. Uh, because it is, of course, uh, the engine room of the nation. And what we've discovered in terms of Brexit is that whilst um, there's been a lot of talk about the separation and about um, Europe not cooperating, Europe will cooperate with the city because we are Europe's bankers as well uh, as the rest of the world. For example, we, um, uh, we exchange more uh, euros in London every day than in the rest of the member states put together. And that is still the case. Wow. We, we clear. Wow. In fact, well, on that subject, we clear more dollars than New York. 
and we clear more RMB than anywhere outside mainland China. Um, so that, that level of liquidity uh, is passing through the, the square mile. It would take the Europeans a very long time to establish the facilities, uh, even to manage that, that, that problem. Um, so Europe will continue to be a major partner with the city. The government hasn't made it exactly easy for us, but the city is, is full of ingenious people who will make that work. At the same time, uh, it's made us realise um, that we've ignored the Commonwealth for a very long time. Now, the Commonwealth uh, of Nations is, is two billion people. Uh, the corporation's view has always been that the Lord Mayor works in emerging economies. So that's why Lord Mayors are found in China, India, Pakistan, Latin America, etc. Uh, and the chairman of policy, which is a, um, a similar role, but from the Common Council, works on New York, the developed areas uh, and, and Europe. Um, so there's a big, big world out there apart from Europe. And Europe is incredibly important to us, 500 million people, but there are more people elsewhere. So we'll continue to thrive. Uh, and um, I used to say when I was in Latin America, if, you, if you're a wealthy person, you want to invest your money through New York, you'll only invest in America. If you invest through um, through London, you'll invest in the entire globe. So we're a, we're a global and planetary thing. So Brexit uh, doesn't uh, unsettle me unduly. Uh, next, if we go to the, the pandemic question, well, this has been a remarkable thing because uh, those 500,000 people are not coming into the square mile every day. In fact, I've been there for the last fortnight and it's virtually deserted. The Corporation of London itself employs 4,000 people and there's nobody in the Guildhall at the moment. But everybody's doing their work. Everybody's getting on with life from home. Financial services have had a good year. If you're an investor, uh, you've had some surprisingly good returns despite um, uh, the, the, the state of, of health of the world. Uh, so um, we will overcome this thing. But when we come back to work, I don't think we're ever going to be working in the same way again. People actually have found that they can do their job at home. Um, obviously, people are missing the human interaction. But why spend a couple of hours a day on the tube when you could be in bed or reading a book or even doing two hours more work. So the, the whole thing will change. And as yet, we don't know when uh, when we're going to be allowed back in. But of course, the square mile isn't just about graft. It's also about sociability. And people do need the, the chats, the brainstorming over the over the water cooler, as they used to say. And we're all, we also have a, a thriving um, nighttime economy. We have uh, a massive cultural offering in the square mile with the Barbican, the museum, and many, many other things. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's good reasons to come into the city other than finance, and, but we'll bounce back. We always do. Yeah, I think that's, <coughs> excuse me, I think that's absolutely right. And uh, um, everybody's talking about what the new norm looks like, and uh, I think it'll take a little while to, to, to figure it out. Uh, I mean, obviously, um, things like theatre, there's such a big pent up demand now for live entertainment and theater and musics and music, live music and all that kind of thing. I think it'll just be a case of maybe over a certain age might be a little bit wary about going back into a theater and seeing people around them, you know? Yeah, exactly. and, but I think, you know, once it appears on TV and you see crowds at football matches again and People will, will slowly but surely, I think, and then and then everybody will be looking back at, oh, do you remember twenty twenty? What a year that was, and yeah. you know, and it'll become part of part of history. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Andrew, thanks very much for joining me today. Uh, some really interesting stuff and some really great stories. I'm loving it, and uh, yeah, I'll certainly, uh, I'll uh, maybe we can have a, a, a maybe we can have some fish and chips at some point when we can go out again when we come up to uh, <clears throat> come up to Bispam and get together and have some fish and chips in the Bispam kitchen or something. So that'd be great. All right, I, I might upgrade you for, for uh, fish and chips in the towel ballroom and we'll listen to the world wor itself. Well, if you insist, <laughs> <laughs> let me think about it. Yes. Okay, uh, but exactly. that's, listen, it shows you, I've just been inspired by you. When you said you just say yes, so I'm yes. just going to say yes. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic Brilliant. meeting. Thank you. Yeah, and you, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed for joining me today on Passions. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.